Welcome back. As we begin chapter five today, we'll continue to talk about the Constitution. But before we do, let's just quickly be reminded of what we talked about in our last lesson. We focused in on the concerns and disagreements that took place regarding the ratification of the Constitution. In the special ratification conventions held in each state, the Federalists, who were advocates of the Constitution, were pitted against anti-Federalists who opposed the new plan of government. The anti-Federalists, just one week after the text was first published, ran a series of anti-Federalist articles written under the pseudonym Cato, who was probably George Clinton, governor of New York. Uh, two other anti-federalists also wrote articles under the pseudonym Brutus and Sidney. Uh, Alexander Hamilton responded to the anti-federalist charges with newspaper articles of his own under the pen name Publius. James Madison and John Jay helped him by writing other articles. Of the 85 essays, all signed Publius, Hamilton wrote 51 Madison, 26, and J, 5. The remaining three were joint efforts by Hamilton and Madison. Now, these essays would eventually be compiled and published in two volumes as the Federalist Papers. Two states were key in the battle between the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. It was vital for the success of the new government that Virginia and New York ratify the Constitution. Now, there were four main differences between the Anti-Federalists and the Federalists. The proposed Constitution and convention legitimacy, the fate of the Union and the states under the proposed Constitution, the lack of a Bill of Rights, and amending the Constitution. But really, the big issues that caused the most problems between the Anti-Federalists and the Federalists was the absence of a Bill of Rights that would protect individual liberties and states' rights, the fact that the states would lose some of their power. Now, George Mason led the anti-federalists in the fight for the Bill of Rights, and Patrick Henry led the way for states' rights. Now, even though the debates were pretty heated, there was no rioting, no bloodshed, and no coup. When the votes were taken and the Constitution was ratified, the Anti-Federalists backed down for the most part. That's huge. George Washington was chosen unanimously as the first president. That was also huge. Speaks on how amazing George Washington was. Okay, so let's get started on today's lesson. We'll concentrate on some of the practical aspects of the Constitution. Today, our Constitution is the world's oldest in continuous use. That speaks volumes on how well our founders framed it. To answer some of those practical aspects of the Constitution that made our Constitution last so long, We'll look at four questions. Now, in this lesson, we'll focus in on the first two. How the Founding Fathers' view of human nature affected the writing of the Constitution and the different approaches to interpreting the Constitution. The Founding Fathers really got a couple of things right, right off the bat, like their perspective of who man is, which is wicked at heart. And they provided for change through both interpretation and amendments. We'll talk more about the amendment process in our next lesson. So let's talk about their view of man, their human nature. The men who wrote the Constitution really did have a very realistic view of human nature. They understand or understood that men and women have a desire for freedom and they have the capacity to govern themselves. But they also had a clear understanding of man's depravity, their tendency towards sin. 
Okay, let's face it, it wasn't a tendency towards sin. It's downright sinfulness. Remember what we talked about in chapter 1 about the creation and fall? Remember that Christ has promised to come back again to make all wrong things right. But in the meantime, because of that sinfulness, the framers had to create a document that would help man restrain that sinfulness. The Constitution isn't a Christian document, though. It was never intended to be. In fact, God isn't even mentioned. But the framers lived in a society where Scripture was pervasive, and their thinking was definitely influenced by basic biblical principles. Understanding the depravity of man, the realization that people tend to misuse power and to be corrupted by power— is what made the writers divide the government and its authority between three branches and create a a checks and balance system so that there wouldn't be an abuse of power. A perfect example of why it was so important for the Framing Fathers to understand the depravity of man was the French Revolution. The French Constitution of 1792 Yeah, about five years after the U.S. Constitution was written. It demonstrated what happens when governments are planned around a false view of human goodness. It held an idealistic, definitely unbiblical view of humans. The French banished Christianity from public life. They had great hopes for both mankind and their constitution. But the Second French Republic lasted for just three years. Those good people substituted the guillotine for their chief governing instrument instead of their constitution. America's constitution was written by men who understood both their capacity to rule and their need for restraint. The framers also realized that the Constitution would need to be able to be adapted and changed as American society changed. This flexibility comes from the document's inherent need for a degree of interpretation. To make that happen, they wrote a a brief and general charter instead of a detailed one where they tried to solve future problems that the United States could encounter. It became a guide rather than a detailed manual on governing. And of course, that guide would need to be interpreted. There are two ends of the spectrum of interpretation. The the strict constructionists, or another term for them is originalists, they believed that the text of the Constitution is important and that Any interpretation should be kept to a minimum. The other end of the spectrum is the broad constructionists who take a broad and sometimes more creative approach to constitutional interpretation. I had a professor who used to say that whichever party controlled the White House would want broad construction and the party out of power would want strict construction interesting concept. So if you want to get something done, you might want to look at the Constitution in a broad sense. If you want to to stop someone else from doing something in the government, you should claim that it's unconstitutional, strict interpretation. Uh, He had a point. Often pragmatism took over those in power. Think of Thomas Jefferson and the Louisiana Purchase perfect example. Thomas Jefferson was always a strict constructionist until he became president. Then he took a broad construction view when it came time to buy the Louisiana Purchase, and he didn't have the time before the decision had to be made to check with Congress. But the two spectrums of interpretation of the Constitution have resulted in its durability as well as in the controversy that surrounds it. You see, almost every move that is made in government is based on whether the Constitution will allow them to do it. Okay, example, there is a vast federal bureaucracy, like 2 million civilian employees. That 
federal bureaucracy isn't mentioned anywhere in the Constitution. But it does say in Article 2, Section 3, that the president shall take care that the laws be faithfully executed. So how is the president going to make sure that the laws are faithfully executed? Not on his own, that's for sure. Unless he's like this micromanager and, and even then he can't police all 325 million people. No, he has to have help. Hence, the two million people that make up the federal bureaucracy. No one really argues about the interpretation of Article 2, Section 3. I mean, it's a natural interpretation. But then there are other interpretations that aren't so natural. For example, the right of privacy. The Founding Fathers obviously believed in the right of privacy, which to them meant that a law-abiding citizen should be protected from unnecessary government intrusion into his life and home. But in Griswold v. Connecticut in 1965, the Supreme Court established a broader interpretation of the constitutional right of privacy using the Third and Fourth Amendments. Remember that the, the Third Amendment protects the citizens from having soldiers boarding in their homes. Yeah. And the Fourth Amendment protects citizens from unlawful searches and seizures. Again, yeah. So what was the Griswold decision pertaining to? A Connecticut law forbidding the sale of contraceptives. Yeah, that is so much broader than what the Third and Fourth Amendments were originally intended for. But it set a precedent for the courts so that the right to privacy provided an umbrella for a variety of liberal social causes like abortion and homosexual rights. Supreme Court Justice Charles Evans Hughes correctly said, We are under the Constitution, but the Constitution is what the judges say it is. That is why it is vitally important that there are judges in place that interpret the Constitution correctly, that they don't use the Constitution to advance their own social agenda. In the Justice Department, it's probably a good idea if they always use strict interpretation. Thankfully, the courts have redefined privacy and made it so that the states define it, therefore placing abortion back into the hands of the states. Let's take a moment and look at Activity 2 on page 37 of your Student Activity Workbook. Follow along while I read the quote. William J. Brennan Jr. said, This court inescapably has the duty as the ultimate arbitrator of the meaning of our Constitution to say whether when individuals condemned to death stand before our bar, moral conceptions require us to hold the, that the law has progressed to the point where we should declare that the punishment of death, like punishments on the rack, the screw, and the wheel, is no longer morally tolerable in our society. So, strict or broad? Broad. Brennan says that this court has the ultimate power to judge the meaning of the Constitution and to decide the meaning of the law according to society's morality at the time of the judgment. In doing so, he places society's moral standard over constitutional law. Hugo L. Black said, Our Constitution was not written in the sands to be washed away by each wave of new judges blown in by each successive political wind. This one is actually a pretty easy one. Strict or broad? <laughs> Strict. Black says that the Constitution isn't a document to change whenever a new group of judges sits on the bench. The changing whims of relativism shouldn't determine what the Constitution means. Warren E. Berger said, 
judges rule on the basis of law, not public opinion, and they should be totally indifferent to pressures of the times. Another easy one, strict or broad? Strict. Berger says that judges are to rule according to law and not be swayed by public opinion or the political pressures of the times. Judges are to be above the fray, basing their decisions on the clear meaning of the law. William O. Douglas said, we deal within a right of privacy older than the Bill of Rights, older than our political parties, older than our school system. Strict or broad? Broad. Douglas says that the right of privacy, which isn't a stated right in the Constitution, is older than the Bill of Rights. Therefore, he would be adding to what is stated in the Constitution, broadening its original meaning. Last but not least, Robert Bork said, there is no other sense in which the Constitution can be what Article 4 proclaims it to be, law. This means, of course, that a judge, no matter on what court he sits, may never create new constitutional rights or destroy old ones. Any time he does so, he violates not only the limits to his own authority, but, and for that reason, also violates the rights of the legislature and the people. The philosophy of original understanding is thus a ne necessary inference from the structure of government apparent on the face of the Constitution. So, after reading the quote, was Robert Bork a strict or a broad constructionist? He was a strict constructionist because he said that no judge can create new or destroy old constitutional rights. If he does, he violates his limits of authority and the rights of the legislature and the people. See how easy it is to add to the Constitution in order for it to advance an agenda? So today, we've looked at how the Founding Fathers' view of human nature affected the writing of the Constitution and the different approaches to interpreting the Constitution, strict or broad. Now let's look at our critical thinking question which has a more positive influence on our government, a strict interpretation or a broad interpretation of the Constitution and why. Now remember, the strict constructionists believed that the, or still believe, that the text of the Constitution is important and that any interpretation should be kept to a minimum. The broad constructionists take a broad and sometimes more creative approach to constitutional interpretation. So let's look at what Will has to say. I would say a strict interpretation is the better influence on the government because if the government sticks to only what the Constitution says, it is forced to stay small and give the people more freedom and control over their own lives. It's true that the government is huge. The less intrusive the government is, the smaller it would be. But then there are a lot of people that, that need good programs that help them. That necessary and proper clause gets stretched to fit a lot of those programs. That's why it's also called the elastic clause. Let's see what Betty has to say. The Constitution was written with the intention of being interpreted broadly because the writers couldn't possibly include every little thing that might come up in the future. They gave us the necessary and proper clause for a reason. Well, Betty thinks that a broad interpretation is better, but can we trust men to be able to restrain their desire for power? Or will they use a broad interpretation to gain the power that they want? So what does Pete have to say? Generally, I would say that the strict interpretation is the better view for a person to take, at least when it concerns the intended purpose or goal of the founders. Hmm, interesting. Both Pete and Betty have an opposite view of, of the intent of the founding fathers. 
Betty says that you can see the broad intent from the necessary and proper clause, and Pete says that the intended purpose or goal was a strict interpretation. So who's right? And therein lies the problem. Not sure if there is a right answer. Think about how passionate Thomas Jefferson was about strict interpretation until he became president, then not so much, hence the Louisiana Purchase. But remember, the judicial branch should use strict interpretation. That way, a judge can't force his social agenda on the people. So next time, we'll be finishing our discussion on the practical aspects of the Constitution by focusing in on that necessary and proper clause and the amendment process. See you then. Have an amazing day.